Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, oh, how wonderful this is that again we can look together into this wonderful Bible that God has given. My, my, we really don't understand what a fantastic privilege this is that we can sit here with a book in front of us that was written by Almighty God. Every word in the original language was right from the lips of Almighty God, who is the creator of the universe and who is the savior of all those that he plans to have with him forevermore in eternity future. My, my that we can have that Bible in, uh, to read. And you know there are people in the world that don't have a Bible, and so if we do have, we ought to consider that this is an extra special blessing of God that we can have our own Bible. And uh, that's why we are, we're, uh, we're glad that we can also uh, read the Bible on our programming so that those who do not have it at least can hear something from the Bible. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Um, good evening, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, wonderful. Um, I will have two questions. The first one is Isaiah 58. Uh, verse 13, yes, 14. Yes, Isaiah 58, where God is talking about, well, he's talking about our Sunday Sabbath, actually. Let's turn to that. Isaiah 58 and verse 13, we read... If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, that's God speaking, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of Jehovah, honorable, and shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in Jehovah. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places uh, of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of Jehovah hath spoken it. Now, what is your question? Question is a couple, I called you like six, seven months ago regarding the fact that I take care of my elderly mother on the weekends, but I also go to work on Mondays, so I have to be back from. Uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, Sunday. So I thought, if I went, if I came back, you said that you shouldn't travel on that day. But if I came back, let's say at ten o'clock at night, would that be okay with the Lord? Well, no. It's not a matter of making a deal with the Lord. It's a matter of attitude and uh, what's really on your heart. You're on your heart. You want to use Sunday as well as possible just to focus on the Lord Jesus. Now, uh, the fact is that that in caring for your mother and then getting back to work on Monday, it may be required that you have to do a little traveling, uh, and you can talk to the Lord about that and ask His forgiveness. But and but uh, it's 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 not it's something very necessary. It's not something like you are going on a vacation on Sunday. It isn't like you are using it for your for your pleasure. You remember the focus of uh, Isaiah 58? Not for our pleasure, but in order to uh, in focus upon the Lord Jesus. And in the process of living for Him, there is that necessity uh, to do a little travel. Well, then we travel. Okay, and my second question is John eleven twenty five to twenty seven. John eleven, verse twenty five 
There we read John 11, verse 25. Jesus said unto her, uh, to Martha, this is at the at the grave site of, uh, of her brother Lazarus. Uh, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Uh, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yes, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God which should come into the world. Okay, my question is, the other day on the Alameda Bible Fellowship, um, someone asked you a question about this, and you said that that was a snare, but unfortunately the cameras went off at that moment. Can you explain how that is a snare? Well, the, I, you see, any place where we read a verse like, uh, we can become saved by believing on the Lord Jesus, watch out. Because when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we find that believing is a work that we do. Now, uh, we do good works after we become saved. We do not good, do good works to contribute to us getting saved. But this language here, as it just stands, uh, if we didn't know that believing was a work, we would think, well... Then, uh, just like we read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth on him. Oh, I have to believe on him, uh, and then God will save me. And uh, that's the trap, because we cannot become saved by any work that we do. First, God has to save us. And that is apart from us believing on him. That is, that is apart from anything that we do. But once he does save us, then we will believe on him as a result of the fact that he has saved us, not as a reason for our salvation. Mr. Camping, can I ask you one last question? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm not quite clear when is it our will and when is it the Lord's will. For example, if I, if I step on a ladder and I fall, is that the Lord's will or was it just accidental? Or I don't understand exactly. When is it our will and when is it the well, Lord's will? We better not try to figure that one out. All we know is that we were careless and uh, and uh, therefore we got injured now it may be that god wanted us to be injured because he plans to use this as a chastisement against us or he may use want to use it for some other purpose we do know that if it was go contrary to god's will that you were going to fall from that ladder you would not have fallen from that ladder. We can't do anything. We can't, uh, nothing can happen to us contrary to the will of God. So, but we don't have to get uh, too uh, puzzled, too difficult, much with this. All we can do is, is, oh, I fell from the ladder and by God's mercy, I didn't get killed. I just broke my arm <laughs> or maybe I didn't hurt myself at all. And it's only the mercy of God. And, uh, and I'm so glad that he still, that I know that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Harold. Um, <clears throat> Harold, I have a question about um, the fig tree prophecy. Uh, Jesus says that the generation that sees Israel once again become its own nation, that that generation shall not pass until um, until the end of the world, until all these things be fulfilled. Okay, so my question is, we take 2011 minus 1948, there's a balance of 63 years. So does that mean that that generation Jesus was talking about is only 63 years long? 
or how long is it a biblical generation? I don't understand what generation is he talking about. The word generation has no timeline on it. Uh, in the first instance, he is talking about the generation of evil, that the that there would be evil in the world right to the very end. Think, for example, of the pre-mill position that had been held and still is held in many churches that there would come a time when Christ is reigning from Jerusalem and uh, sin would be pretty much eradicated. Uh, in other words, there would not be... Uh, Christ would be reigning uh, and everyone would be following him. That's utterly impossible. This generation will continue to the end of the world. And and go right into the day of judgment, as a matter of fact. But also, the generation of Israel would continue. Uh, that, that we only know because of other prophecies that God made, that they would still uh, be uh, there uh, as long as there were any Gentiles still becoming saved. They would still be there. Now, it is true that they were not operating as a nation for uh, uh, 1900 and, uh, well, uh, nine, almost 1948 years, a little over 1900 years. They were not operating as a, as a nation amongst the nations of the world, but the Jewish line existed. Uh, the uh, blood descendants of Abraham were still in the world, and it was in 1948 that they again were were uh, brought together as a nation of, amongst the nations of the world for uh, uh, something that was very important in God's timeline of history. But that did not mean now they again exist as a generation. Uh, it uh, they have always been here. But oh, I see. I see. Now, my second question, thank you for that. Now, my second question is, um, when, we look, when we look at May 21st, 2011, that is the last day of the 8,400-day Great Tribulation. That's the last day of possible salvation. It's May 21, 2011. I, now, I, I don't know. I, I found it very interesting that that ended on the Saturday, which was the seventh day of the, seventh day of the week. Um, any significance there that it ends on the Jewish Sabbath? Uh, I don't think it's significant that it ends on the Jewish Sabbath. It ends on the seventh day of the week because uh, their creation began on Sunday, and uh, it's and seven is highly featured in uh, in the end time. Uh, there will be about 7 billion people in, a, in existence in the world at that time. It was uh, 7 times 7 times 7 times 7, four sevens. Since God had finished uh, uh, writing anything uh, as part of the Old Testament, uh, and there are, there are some other sevens that, that it, 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 we, it might have some interest that way, that it is the end of something like Saturday is the end of a week. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I just have two questions, please. Yes, go ahead. Okay, my first question is, I, I thought I heard you say once before that... Um, that only a couple million people will be going to heaven? From what we can read in the Bible, we have a number given in Re Revelation 9, a number uh, 200 million, and that has a high, that could be a symbolical number, but it has a, the way it's written, it also could be a very literal number, that when God uh, designed the whole uh, business of planet Earth and and everything that he has done, that it was his purpose that out of all those that lived here, uh, there would be 200 million that would, would uh, 
uh, be would come into existence that God planned to use throughout eternity future to assist ruling in a new heaven and a new earth. That is very well uh, possible. Salvation, you know, is uh, 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 believers, true believers, they die just like unsaved people die when, when, uh, or during the 13,000 years uh, uh, until the day of judgment. Uh, there are people living and dying and, and uh, you can't tell them outwardly whether they were a believer or not a believer. Both simply died. In the case of, of most of the people, that was the end of their existence. They had no more consciousness of any kind. They didn't suffer in any ways. Uh, they lived very, very similarly to those who are true believers. But when God talks about salvation, it means it adds a great big uh, plus, namely that we will be uh, we will be resurrected on the last day. Our bodies will be resurrected or changed if we were living at that time into a glorified spiritual body, so that we will be reigning with Christ forevermore and be co-heirs with him of the new heaven and the new earth. That is really the essence of what salvation provides because insofar as living on planet earth, uh, it, uh, 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 people who obey God's laws, even though they are not elect, they can live just as pleasurably as a true believer. Thank you, Mr. Camper. And my second question is... Um, before I heard that we won't remember certain things, now will we not remember almost everything, or what things won't we remember in the new heaven and the new earth? The Bible, the language of the Bible is that everything will be gone. It'll be annihilated. There's no rec no remembrance of anything. The law of God, that is the principles that are illustrated by various uh, historical events and conversations and so on, uh, they will be gone, but the law itself, like thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not uh, worship other gods and so on, that goes on into eternity. That it never does change. So, Mr. Camping, when, when, we're, when the new heavens and the new earth are there, and if I'm a citizen, I will not remember why I'm here? You will not. It will be a brand new beginning. Uh, absolutely, we read it, and uh, and uh, uh, we can't <laughs> we we can't deny this language is there, and so we have to accept it. In Isaiah chapter 65, uh, there, where we read in uh, in uh, verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. In other words, this whole, this whole historical thing that has been going on for more than 13,000 years and is going to come to an end here in the next year and a half, it's going to come to an end. We'll all be gone. It'll never, never come into a mind again. It's, it has accomplished its purpose uh, and, and in bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was a big purpose, that, that through everything that has happened here, all the other principalities and powers that God may have created and exist somewhere, uh, they will... They have a, a witnessed the glorious attributes and characteristics and nature of God himself. And now that's all done with. And now, uh, uh, as a final outcome of this, there are, uh, uh, from what we read in Romans 9, if that's a literal number, there are 200 million people that will be there at the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth. And... And uh, they had no remember nothing about what happened before to them. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, go ahead with your call. Hi, Mr. Camping. Thank you very much for taking my call. I have a couple questions for you. What are your questions? What if I'm not one of the predestined to be saved? What if you're not? It, what if I'm not? And how do I know if I am or not? Well, the the Bible teaches in Romans 8, around uh, verse 15, that God's Spirit, that's God Himself, witnesses with our spirit, that's our soul existence, that we are sons of God. Now, God, okay. the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And if we are a child of God, it will... It, it will be that we have an intense interest in the Bible. Uh, we want to know what God is teaching as best we can know it, and when we want to be obedient to it. And if we fall into sin, we feel terrible, terrible about it. And if, in other words, the, as we as we uh, come to the end, we're going to have a greater and greater appreciation of the authority of the Word of God and will have an intense desire to want to be obedient. And that can be evidence that I must, God must have saved me. Okay. Um, my second question kind of falls into the, to the first uh, answer that you've given me. Um, I've been living um, a pretty sinful life uh, recently, um, and I'm afraid that 2011 will come and I will not be saved. Um, how do how can I be assured uh, to be saved from uh, from here up until uh, you know that time comes? The, 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 there's nothing that anybody could ever do to guarantee that they were going to get saved. That's an okay. impossibility. That's altogether God's work. But God uh, gives us the illustration of uh, in the book of Jonah when the Ninevites were told and they they were very wicked very wicked they were that was the capital of Assyria it was a very wicked country they didn't know anything about the bible even and yet uh, they uh, uh, they cried to God for mercy. They sat in, and humbled themselves, recognizing, oh, we've been wicked and we deserve the wrath of God. And, uh, and uh, we are trying now uh, to stop that wickedness and, and we're pleading with God, is it possible that he might change his mind? And you know, God uh, speaks about a uh, uh, broken and a contrite heart is pleasing to God. And, of course, we'll never have a broken and a contrite heart that's pleasing to God until He has saved us. He, uh, but that is that can be the evidence of salvation. And so you start... Uh, all we can do is plead and beg and beseech God and walk very humbly recognizing we don't deserve that salvation at all. We deserve the wrath of God. But maybe, maybe, maybe God might have have uh, uh, mercy. And my, he is a merciful God. And He is saving many people today. And maybe I could be one of them. Okay. So, um, you know, from... This day forward, continue to be merciful and ask for forgiveness and um, do what I'm supposed to do, um, do what's right, what God requi requires me to do, and um, and do the right thing. And um, hopefully, he'll he'll know that my my heart and my intentions are true, and that that's what I'm genuinely trying to do. I want to be to be a, much closer to God than I ever have been. Well, you get, and I've always found it hard to to um, to really uh, put uh, myself uh, there. Excuse me. How do we draw closer to God? How does uh, we want to hear God speak to us? You, just imagine. Just think about this. We, we, God is somewhere. We can't see God. We can't uh, uh, say hi there at all. 
but we can hear him speak to us. When you open your Bible and begin to read there, that is God speaking to you personally. You can't get any closer to God than that. And in turn, when you pray to God uh, with a broken and and very humbly uh, plead with him, you can know that God is hearing you, that you are able to speak directly to eternal God. You can't get any closer than that. But but we don't dictate to God. We don't tell him, now, oh, Lord, now you've got to save me. After all, after all, I'm a pretty good person. No way. We don't dictate to God at all because we don't deserve anything from God. He already has given us a wonderful world to live in. He has given us uh, uh, lots of joys, lots of friends, lots of good food that was been a joy in our life. Uh, a lot of this and a lot of that. And uh, and uh, uh, we, we really, uh, God doesn't owe us anything, nothing. And... Uh, uh, and Uh, uh, now that we are asking for salvation we're asking oh Lord could it be that we could also have that extra extra wonderful privilege of reigning with you forevermore uh, that we might have uh, that we might have eternal life and and all that all the glamorous wonderful things that go with with that uh, and uh, we don't. I we know we don't deserve it at all. But oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Very well, thank you so much. I have uh, two questions. Uh, my question is uh, number question number one question is actually both questions come from Book of Revelations. The number one question is in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, about the two witnesses, the one who raised from the dead, God will raise them from the dead. Who are those two witnesses? Can we know? Yes, we can know, and we'll talk about that right after this message. Hold on, please. In Revelation 11, God discusses two witnesses. He describes them. In uh, verse 4 of Revelation 11, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man shall hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. My, my, who are these two witnesses? These are, that remember Christ spoke in parables. They represent every true believer. Now, the power that is spoken about here is not in the fact that they are believers, but in the fact that they are uh, that they are uh, 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 they are uh, of, of, they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. They are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have the power of God behind them. They have the power of uh, of as God as they bring the gospel. It is God who can uh, bring judgment. It is God who can bring salvation. And the witnesses are the uh, carita- carriers of that gospel. They, in other words, and they're called two candlesticks because they are bringing the light of the gospel to the world. Uh, they are called two olive trees because uh, oil comes from olive. Uh, from olives and the and it is again the oil of the gospel that uh, is produced uh, they are anyone who is a true believer at any time 
in the history of the world in actuality. And today, for example, there are many, many true believers who are in their little corner trying to share the precious gospel, trying to warn people that the judgment day is almost here. They are included in the two witnesses. Okay, okay. Uh, my second question is, uh, uh, the book of Revelation chapter 14 again about, talks about the 144,000 people. Those are the one who follow the Lamb, then they are virgins. Who are these 144,000 people? Where they come from? The number 144,000, it, it, uh, it identifies it. It's, they're spoken of in Revelation 7 as uh -huh. 12,000 that come from each of 12 of the tribes of Israel. And it's not uh -huh. national Israel that is in view. It is the Israel of God. And uh, uh, the number 144,000, because of its character, we know uh, for sure that it is a symbolical number. The number 1,000 signifies completeness. The number 12, fullness. And it, it is typifying the full, the complete fullness of all those who are true believers. And, uh, when we, when we read about the 144,000 people, these people, they are virgins. They were called, they're, they're called virgins because they are uh, they are absolutely righteous. They are not sinful. They are, their sins have all been covered by the Lord Jesus Christ, and they are ready to be the bride of Christ forevermore. Uh, and you know, uh, you don't marry uh, uh, someone who's married already. You marry a virgin, and Christ. Right. Has, they are the bride of Christ. Therefore, they are called virgins. Okay, okay. All yeah. right, uh, Pastor, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Um, I have three questions. Uh, my first question is, um, you refer uh, over and over to the Ninevites and how they cried out uh, for the Lord to forgive them and cover their heads with sackcloth and ashes, and that they were, in fact, saved. And my question is, um, in, in, if people in today's world, and my question is, you said that the Lord saved people before the creation of the earth? Well, and my question uh, uh, is, they... they no, he has, he has made provision for their salvation. He's done all the work of making payment for their sins. He has not saved them until they actually become people. And then at some time in their life, either as a little baby or an hour before they're born, or they die, or any time in between then, that God applies the Word of God to that, that person's life, and he becomes saved. That is, he, get, he receives his eternal soul in which he will never die and in which he will spend eternity with Christ. He still has to have his salvation completed, however, in that he still must have his body also be changed into a, a spiritual body that will live forever with Christ. But his salvation occurs after he is born, after he, uh, at some point in his lifetime. But the provision for his salvation that makes it possible for God to forgive all of his sins, uh, makes it possible for God to rightly give that person an eternal soul, it was, that was taken care of before God created the world. All right, Brother Camping. So now, it does does someone need to make a conscious decision um, to uh, and ask the Lord to be to save him before he's saved? 
we we can plead with God. We can beg God for salvation. We we are uh, we're not saved as yet. Okay. Let's say let's say that we are were one of those that were named by God and God actually made payment for our sins and God has not saved us as yet and we're 30 years old or 40 or 50 years old and and oh we're beginning to desire that we might be saved and so we beg God we plead with him oh God is it possible that I too might have have thy mercy put upon me and because I I am because God had all already made provision for my salvation at some point he will save me not because I've been begging him in fact he may we may be even begging him because we're already saved it's curious you know when we read about the Ninevites they believed God uh, that is God and the only way uh, they could believe God as if God had saved them and so uh, because God had saved them therefore they were sitting in sackcloth and ashes and pleading with God so so God doesn't determine because God knows all of us will be born God knows everything but God hasn't pre-selected those that will be saved that that we need to believe to be saved is that it, correct it, it's all mysterious it's all in God's hand we God does not tell us if we're elect of God God does not uh, until after we're saved and then we re recognize that we're saved only because God had elected us to salvation he had done all the work additionally to make it possible for our salvation but before we do become saved even though we are elect of God we don't know that we don't we have no idea uh, and all we know is is that God says that I a broken and a contrite heart I will not despise God says that he is saving a great many people right today and God gives us the illustration of the Ninevites in the book of Jonah uh, that they did become saved and so that encourages us well then I'm going to be begging begging and maybe it is that I'm begging because God has already saved me, but I don't know that. I have no idea about that. All I know is is that that I have to wait upon God 100% if he's going to save me. That we're saved uh, even if we believe in our hearts, that, that even if we believe the Word of God, we, we can't know until until we die whether no. we're saved or not. Romans 8, verse 15 says that God's... Let me read it now so we'll have it right in front of us. And Romans 8, God says... Oh, let me see. That'd be Romans 8. God declares in verse 16... The Spirit, that's God Himself, the Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, that's a promise of God. And, uh, and so we can know, we can know. Now, we could, be, we could become saved and die 20 minutes later or th three hours or three days later and not ever uh, know that we had become saved because it, we may we we don't know instantly when god gives us a brand new soul eat with eternal life where all we know is is that there's a big change in our life of some kind because when we have been given a new resurrected a new eternal soul that in which we never never will sin uh, the sin is still going to trouble us because we have a body that still has to be saved. But it, 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 it's going to make a profound difference in the way we look at the law of God and in the way in which we live our life in this world. And that, okay. uh, and that will be the evidence to us that I must, God must have saved me because I find 
Yeah, it's different. It's a lot different. I feel I I I, I look at the Bible differently than I did uh, two years ago or five years ago or whatever. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Matthew 4, 3 and 4. And I got a question. Matthew 4, verse 3 and 4. Let's look at that. Matthew 4. And when the tempter came to him... This is Jesus being tested for 40 days and 40 nights after he had just been announced as the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And and God, the Holy Spirit, that is God himself, drove him into the wilderness to be tested by Satan, the master deceiver, if you will. And... Uh, the temper, tempter that Satan came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that this, that these stones be made bread. Because if you're the Son of God, you can do miracles. And show me, show me. Uh, and now Christ answers, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Satan, you know, is tempting with the Word of God. That's the sword that he carries and which, by which he causes people to fall into sin. They think they're serving Christ when they're serving Satan because he quotes from the Bible. And uh, we never have to think that he hesitates to talk about the blood of Christ or whatever. He is the master deceiver. And here he's quoting from the Bible but God is Christ is answering him by uh, by uh, indicating that uh, look uh, it's more important that I obey God than I worry about some bread. Brother Campin. Yes. Read uh, verse five, six, and seven too, and it shows you Satan doing just that again. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. We don't know how all well that happened, but it did. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou, shall, that thou dash, dash thy foot against a stone. Again, you notice, God is teaching us that Satan comes quoting the Bible. Don't ever forget that. Where he comes quoting uh, the Bible. Uh, he, of course, is going to put a different meaning on it, but nevertheless, a lot of people think, well, just because someone is quoting the Bible, they must be of God. Well, here God t t teaches us no way. No way. We have to look for some other things. And then God, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Christ quotes also from the Bible, and that, that, that again, is an illustration of comparing Scripture with Scripture in order to come to truth. In other words, if we just listen to one verse, we can get an idea, oh, I can do this, or God will do that, or whatever. But then when we look at anything else that might relate, we may find, yes, but, but, what God really means here is quite different when, that, than what you thought it did when you just looked at that one verse alone. But thank you for calling in, Sharon. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Campion. Yes. Um, could you read um, Revelation uh, 5? Uh, verse, let me see, uh, verse 10, 11. Revelation 5, verse 10 and 11. And he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, 
and the beast that would be better translated the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands now what is your question well, I was talking about uh, verse 11 verse uh, and uh, 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands uh, couldn't that possibly mean more than 200 million right there well, no, 10,000 times, uh, uh, that would be uh, 10 million, 1,000 times 1,000, wouldn't that be 10 million? And thousands of thousands. In other words, this this has to be understood as just a great number, but we don't know what the number is. This is the kind of language that c c could never be a precise, literal language. It is... It is, uh, it is uh, symbolical or spiritual. Uh, in other words, the, uh, ten, uh, both the number thousand, ten thousand, thousands, they're all numbers signifying completeness. There's a complete number of those that God has saved. Okay, thank you for explaining that to me. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping. Yes. Could you please read Luke twelve thirty six to 38? Yes, Luke 12, verse 36 to 38. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for the Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Uh, blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall find, and if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. Now, what is their question? How are we to understand the second or third watch oh these are uh, is simply indicating he's coming uh, the, the second or third watch or night time and, uh, and he's coming at, at a time of spiritual night time because it'll be the end of the gospel in the world altogether and, uh, and uh, uh, but, he's, but it could be uh, whenever whenever when there is spiritual night time, when d spiritual darkness has, is about to descend upon the world, and, and it'll never have the light of the gospel again, uh, because that's the end of the gospel. But it's, always, not, it's, not, it's not trying to tell us uh, uh, anything about... We already God has given us plenty of information when we learn May 21 is the day of the of the catching up and the day of the beginning of the uh, day of the judgment day uh, and the fact that that the judgment day will last for five months and end on may on october twenty one wow wow i'm just amazed amazed beyond a measure that God has given us all that detail but i'll tell you God is really you're really giving us that detail so that we can get a, a, a better and better picture of what the end is so that, in turn, we can warn the world more specifically and more uh, accurately about what is ha going to happen. Mr. Campin, you don't, you don't believe that those servants don't know the time when it says second or third watch? Because a watch is a period of time, and What's and God uh, in root in in verse forty, uh, we're told to be ready, because the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not, and it would just well, seem that these servants don't know. But you have to bear in mind that word watch is used in many many places, and we have and to look at all watch. of excuse me we have to look at all of those places. And then we find that those who are watching, they are the ones who will know. They, Christ will not come as a thief in the night 
for them because they are watching. As a matter of fact, they are watching also because they uh, have a task. Uh, they are the true believers, and they have a task. Of ha They must warn the world that the enemy is coming. The enemy of the world is Christ. And uh, as we read in Ezekiel 18 and in Ezekiel 33, and for that reason, we're all, all also watching. And so, when it says here uh, that uh, that it's talking about watching, it is it is simply indicating yes, that is the task that the true believers have as we're right near the end. And already, just because we've been watching, God has opened up all kinds of scriptures that are not open to those who are not watching. In the churches, they don't understand what we're talking about here, uh, about Christ is not coming as a thief in the night for the true believers. They don't understand what it means that, the, that, the, uh, that Satan rules in the congregation. They don't understand all kinds of things that we can know because we are watching. And, uh, and they're not watching, and therefore they are not listening to the Word of God. They are only listening to their churches. They're listening to their, God, to their re religion that they have developed as, uh, based on some of the verses in the Bible. I said some of the verses, but not all of them by any means. Um, if I could ask another question on the word watch, you use that word a lot and you interpret that as, as knowing the, um, the exact day. Um, I, I read of it being um, understood as to be vigilant, to be um, not ready, but, well, to be vigilent. Um, well, you could, you, know, the, you, uh, can, you can understand it that way. But look at what we're reading in verse 3 of Revelation 3. It's not a synonym for vigilance. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. And then it says, Re Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, what is God saying here? If you are watching, I'll not come upon you as a thief. You will know the time when I am coming. And it's not, to, and of course, when we're watching, we are vigilant, but our, we're not vigilant because we're looking at the stars or looking at the sky. We're vigilant because we're looking in the Bible. And, and, and as we read the Bible, uh, we have discovered that God gives all kinds of information that that uh, that uh, uh, we can't, can't know unless we're really watching the Bible very carefully. And I can tell you this: that if I go back in my own pilgrimage, my own life, if I go back thirty or forty years, and I was beginning to learn something about the timeline of history, I hadn't the slightest idea that I would ever know the day of the end of the world. I was in, uh, it was, uh, I was in the churches, and I believe just like all the people believe in the churches, Christ is coming as a thief in the night. But what happens is, you can use the word vigilant, that's okay. Because what happens is, if we're vigilant, we keep studying the Bible. We keep studying the Bible. We keep studying the Bible and praying for wisdom. And then, because it was God's plan, not because we were so smart and we finally discovered this, but it was God's plan that right near the end, there would be a whole lot of information in the Bible that had been sealed that had been given in the days of Daniel and then written into the Bible and then sealed up and was not to be opened up until our day. And so, as we're very vigilantly looking in the Bible, trying to learn everything we can, well, look at this. Look at this. It, we are beginning to see that we can know the very day of the end. And then God gives us proofs fantastically 
marvelous proofs to show that indeed we have been doing our homework correctly. God, in his mercy, oh, it's not because we were so smart or because we were so diligent. It's because God, in his mercy, opened our spiritual eyes to what we were reading in the Bible. But thank you for calling and sharing. And, oh, we have, we're ready uh, to uh, come to our next our next. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> for, for our next message and so right after this we will go to our next caller we're continuing with the open forum and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello brother camping yes I had two questions on two separate verses the first one is First Thessalonians four sixteen and 17 First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. Yes. All right, let's look at that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall r rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, what is your or question? My question, Brother Camping, is the part that says we are caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord... And I understand, I don't know where this verse is, when Jesus comes back, he touches down on the Mount of Olives. Isn't that two separate? Th that he touches down on the Mount of Olives? Yes, I'm not sure where that verse is. When Jesus Oh, that's with in, that's in uh, Zechariah chapter 1, I think. Isn't that two separate occasions? The first one here, we're caught up into the clouds, but when Jesus returns... Now, now remember that Christ spoke in parables and uh, we have to re remember that that God gave lots of demonstrations illustrating a, uh, the literal truth and we and uh, when he talks about his feet standing on the Mount of Olives it doesn't mean literally his feet are going to be there it means that he has uh, the time for the end is here and uh, and uh, Christ is uh, 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 finishing what what 13,000 years of history have produced there are the complete there is the completion of the salvation of all those that he planned to save namely that they are given their glorified spiritual bodies in which they will live forevermore with Christ uh, that's the one big thing Secondly, that he has come to complete the judgment process that still remains, uh, uh, that will be completed during the day of judgment. And those two, when those two events, events are completed, then this world is gone. Then nothing will ever be remembered or come into mind again. And we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That... That well, that again is a figure, a, a portrait of the fact that we are caught up to be with Christ. And Christ, the clouds normally are speaking about judgment. And Christ is, is, uh, is, uh, is on the one hand, he has, he has come to, to bring judgment day. But on the other hand, he has come to, uh, to provide our the completion of our salvation. In either case, the fact is, it all it, it, it revol revolves around the Lord Jesus, that he has come. And because these two great events are occurring, we know that he has come, that uh, this is a clear demonstration that he has come to receive us and complete our salvation and also to complete the judgment process. Okay, you're talking about judgment. Can we just go real quick to Second Thessalonians verse 
uh, chapter 1, verse 6 through 9. I had a quick question there. Second Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Is that your quote? Yep. Or in verse 9. And to you who are troubled... Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, what is your question? Well, does that, I mean, that's, that states there that there's people that are afflicting us. Why do they hate the gospel of Jesus Christ so much? I mean, and how do we approach that when we're... Why do they hate the gospel? Yes. Well, because mankind has rebelled against God, beginning with Adam and Eve. Mankind was created as a very, very special individual. Our, our persons, we were created in the image and likeness of God. I still don't know what God meant by all of that. In the image and likeness of God. Now, we know for sure that it didn't mean we could speak and, and uh, bring a uh, hippopotamus into existence or to bring a, a, a mountain into existence. Only God could do that. But nevertheless, we were created with minds so that we could think out things and and uh, figure out how to make it. And that's why this world is so fantastic today. There's so many fabulous toys and fabulous uh, communication devices and so on that are that are coming because man has a mind that's that's somewhat like the mind of God. An animal can't do that. Uh, we have a body just like an animal, and we we uh, uh, we we have blood, and we have two eyes and two ears, and so on, just like an animal. But but an animal can't do what we can do. But nevertheless, nevertheless. Uh, 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 we were uh, we were created uh, in the image and likeness of God. Now mankind rebelled against God, and immediately they lost their eternal life. It meant that when they when they did live out their life on the planet Earth and then die, and that was the end of them. They would uh, they would still later on be shamed as a final part of the of the. Uh, re retribution of God for their sins, but they would not physically experience that. They would never have conscious existence again, and uh, that's the way. Uh, that's the way it was with mankind. But, but the fact is that that uh, mankind became proud. If you go through the Bible, it's amazing how often we read about God or the, the idea that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, that God is uh, is uh, got ugly things to say about those who come with their pride before him. But that's the nature of man. And you know, I, 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 that's what we call ego. I, me, myself, and I, I, I I'm the greatest, and, and so on. And we are not recognizing God. Mankind doesn't want to recognize God. After all, I am who I am, and look what I can do, and look what I have done, and so on. And uh, and they don't want to knuckle under to a God who uh, they should be worshiping and thanking for all the things that are happening in this world and in, in their life, all the good things that he sends the rain and the warm sunshine on the just and on the unjust, and so on. And so, uh, God is a, is a is a, an irritant. I wish God wasn't here. That's what the evolutionist tries to prove. That's what the atheist tries to prove. Uh, God, I, I don't want to. I don't want God. Let's 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 think about this. We can figure out a, a plan for this earth that doesn't include God at all, right? Through adaptation. 
over billions of years or millions of years all these wonderful creatures were designed how dumb how dumb literally dumb but that's required in order to satisfy the the uh, pride of man the ego of man and that's why the opposite is that when we become a child of God we come broken before God oh Lord we're nothing we don't deserve anything we're sinners we deserve thy wrath and and oh Lord what the blessings that thou give, give us us we don't deserve them at all we just thank thee and thank thee and thank thee and and would we ask that thou will help us to work, to try to be more and more obedient to you and because we know that the bible is your law book we really hold it in the highest esteem and we want to try to be as obedient as possible to anything and everything in the bible because uh, you've done everything for us and and we don't we don't deserve anything but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello brother Hal. yes uh, Isaiah chapter 4 verse 1 the seven women that I used to thought it was talking about the the church in Revelation 2 and yeah. 3, but I'm sure I'm wrong about that. Could you explain that for me, please? Yes. Take my answer to the radio. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, in, this is a very, very interesting statement, and because Christ spoke in parables, we can. Re this happens to be one that's fairly easy to understand. In that day, and he's talking about the day when, when, uh, 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 when the churches would go all together in rebellion against God, they would want their kind of a gospel based again on their pride. We we can do it. Thank you, Lord. We can do it. We've got enough encouragement from the Bible, enough hints and uh, to get started, and and we can build up around the the verses that we pick out in the Bible, and we'll develop a a gospel program that's very satisfactory to us. And so here it is. In that day, seven women. Now remember, uh, seven is the number of completeness or of perfection. It's including all of the churches. They were typified by the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. Those are simply types or pictures of all the churches that would ever come into existence. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man. What man is that? Oh, that's Christ. That's Christ. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. And He is the key to why we are the true church. We trust, we identify completely with Christ. Sing. But now notice, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach that is our shame in other words oh we have to have christ there's no church that that calls itself a christian church in any sense of the word or I, uh, the, the, that does not feature christ 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 is everything that makes them holy. That makes them identify with the, with the God of the Bible. But we want to eat our own bread. Now, what is the bread we're supposed to eat? Christ said, I am the bread of life. I am. And what is the clothing we're supposed to wear spiritually? We're supposed to be robed with Christ's righteousness. But, oh, no, 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 Lord. Oh, no, we, we want Christ, but we, we have a better plan. We, we've designed a, a way of salvation that is very acceptable to our people. It helps people to see their need of coming to church, and it just it's working well. My, look at, in our day, look at, we have 30,000 people coming to our church. How did that happen? 
Well, it's because we have designed the the gospel plan that we wanted to follow. But it's all in the name of Christ. He is there. And so it says, Only let us be called by thy name, that they have to have Christ in order to take away their shame. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful. Now the branch of the Lord is Christ himself. Christ himself and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. They are the ones that are no longer tied into the churches. They have come out of that that whole area of people that are that are uh, externally identified with the kingdom of God, and it's just between that individual and God, God and me, me and God. They are the ones that that are that are truly saved. They are the last that are have become saved, and yet they have become the first. And uh, and and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. And these are the ones that have escaped. This now is talking about Zion and Jerusalem as the eternal, true Jerusalem, the eternal kingdom of God that we enter into when we truly have become saved, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. That is, those who were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That is, those are the ones that God already had made provision for their salvation before He ever created the world. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, uh, you say that nobody can know that they're saved. Is that correct? I'm sorry? You say that nobody can know that they are saved? No, I haven't said that at all. I was. I, oh, I thought you had. Let me that. read Romans 8 again, because this is what God is saying. God is saying here in Romans 8, verse 16. Now, this came from the mouth of God. These are not my words. I, I understand that. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And and that comes as we as we find an intense desire to be obedient to the Word of God. We find an intense attraction to the Word of God. And we find that there's... Our, our life is different than it's ever been before. Something has happened. God has given us a new soul, eternal soul, that we're going to go into heaven with at the uh, whenever God takes us home. And uh, and it's uh, in that new soul will never sin again, as we read in First John, chapter three, verse nine. And it means that that uh, sin has become very loathsome, very un- we're un- very unhappy with any sin that shows up in our life. We only want to do God's will. Yes, okay. Now, uh, that's what I always believe, but then I hear you tell some people they can't know that they are saved. Well, you know, it, and I know it's nothing we can do to get saved, okay? It's all the grace of God. Is that correct? Well, you see, his, it's, it's over against this fact. If you go into any church, and most many, most of us living today have been part of a congregation. I have been a part of a congregation for the first 70 years of my life. So I know thoroughly what goes on, in, or, or as thoroughly as anyone, what goes on in the churches. You ask someone, are you a child of God? Well, now, yes, I am. I'll tell you why. I was baptized in water, and that is called for if you're going to become saved. I gave a witness to the congregation. I made profession of faith. And God says that if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. Uh, I, I uh, uh, actually have accepted the Lord Jesus. I, I, and I have come to believe in him. I really believe in him with all my heart. 
and not only I but the elders and the and the deacons and the uh, and the uh, and uh, and the pastor they have looked they've examined me and they agree I'm a child of God and they allowed me to become a member in full communion and therefore I know that I am saved and on the basis of what they are basing their knowledge they have absolutely nothing to uh, say that they have become saved in fact they are testifying that they are absolutely not saved because they are trusting in work that they have done to accomplish this salvation and that's absolutely impossible right because the bible says not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy but now uh like the philippian jr uh when paul said believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved but now uh, now, now, wait a minute now let me finish my statement now if he said that uh, was Paul lying to him? I mean, did the Philippian uh, Jehor believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the, the, that's was, a very... Uh, or was Paul lying to him? And right, the, not, through not. the Bible, it says, and this is the record that you... Excuse me. That you... Uh, excuse me. Now, this is, uh, this is a trap. That's a snare. When we read in the book of Acts, and, and uh, uh, God... Uh, told Paul uh, gave the words but to the jailer of Philippi when he asked the question how can I become saved believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved that just seems so simple so easy to understand what, uh, what else do we have to do but remember the b- biblical rule we have to compare scripture with scripture so let's examine those words believe well, we go to First Thessalonians chapter 1, and we read there that faith is work. And faith is, is, is the noun for the verb believing. It's work. And the Bible clearly says we cannot be saved by our works. So that immediately says, wait a minute, God. What, how can that be? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I, 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 you mean I have to do some work to become saved? That's not allowed. The Bible says it's not by works that we do. Then how can I believe? Oh, I see. When God saves me, then I will do good works. When he uh, saves me, then I will do good works because the fruit of the, because, uh, 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 good, like the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, uh, believing, or faith, uh, and so on. These are all good works. That's a product of the fact that God has saved me. Now, but then, now, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, what does it mean, then, that first God has to save you, and then, as a result of that, you're believing on the Lord, and you're going to still have to be saved? That's a contradiction. No, it isn't, because salvation comes in two parts all the work was done by Christ before the foundation of the world he made the payment for our sins but we are not saved until God applies the word of God to our lives and gives us a resurrected or an eternal soul which is a resurrected we, we, it's like we have risen with Christ and we are now prepared in our soul to be with Christ forevermore. We have been saved, but we have not been saved completely. There's still salvation that has to occur. Namely, we have a body that needs to become saved. And so when Christ, uh, when God gave the words, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, that's absolutely true. You, If you if you have become saved, you God has given you a new resurrected soul, then you will believe on the Lord Jesus, and there is guaranteed that you still, your salvation will be completed, namely that you will receive your eternal resurrected body on the last day. 
And so uh, it, uh, it, it only by very carefully searching the Bible and carefully comparing Scripture with Scripture do we finally understand how we are to understand these verses. But my, my, if we just take it simple and say, well, God would not trap us, would he? Uh, he would, wouldn't he make it easy? Look, he could have written a Bible so any eight-year-old or seven-year-old could understand it perfectly. But he wrote it with all kinds of snares and traps and difficulties so that we are crying out for wisdom, for mercy to God and walking more and more humbly because we don't understand this and that. And also it would, it would trap those who are deciding that they want to be in charge of their salvation rather than wait upon God. Mr. But, Camping. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Camping, uh, can you take care of my question, please? I'm sorry? Uh, can you take my question? Now, you, what you said is true, but now... The Philippian jailer couldn't compare Scripture with Scripture because he didn't have the rest of the Bible. He had the Old Testament, but nothing else as far as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and so on. So he couldn't compare Scripture with Scripture. So he had to rely on what Paul told him. Is that correct? No, no. I, we, he was saved. God saves him if he became saved. We, we don't rely on the Bible. I do. God does the work of saving us. There are all kinds of people in the world who are called the last who will become first. They know very, very little of the Bible. Look at the Ninevites. What did they know about the Bible? They were a wicked nation. They knew nothing about the Bible, and yet God saved them. And, and as a consequence, we read about them in Matthew 12, that they will that they will be caught up in, in the rapture and be a, a condemnation of those who, 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 uh, have, who have the Bible and, uh, and are not following it. Yeah, no, uh, the work of salvation is God's work, 100%. We have the notion that we have to do something. We have to accept Christ. We have to believe. We have to do something. And God says, no way, you can't do anything. You can't. How did you, could you assist in making payment for your sins? Could you assist in, in taking your old soul and making that a brand new eternal soul? Can you assist in changing your, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, your present evil body that still wants to sin into a perfect spiritual body that will go on forevermore? Of course not. We can't do any of that. It all is God's work. But in our pride, we want to take some credit. But with that note, I have to say good night because we've come to the end of our program. Until our next program, may the Lord richly bless you.